Welcome to ID the Future, a podcast about intelligent design and evolution. Welcome to Intelligent Design the Future. I'm Casey Luskin. We have on the show with us again today, Dr. Carolyn Crocker, president of the American Institute for Technology, Science, and Education, and recent author of the book, Free to Think, Why Scientific Integrity Matters, published by Leafcutter Press in 2010, where she tells her story of how she got expelled from George Mason University after mentioning both ID and evolution in a classroom. Dr. Crocker got her PhD in immunopharmacology at Southampton University in the UK, and she did postdoctoral research studying the interactions between proteins in a signal transduction pathway involved in the immune system at the Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences in Bethesda, Maryland. And she also got her MSc from Birmingham University and a BSc from Warwick University, also in the UK. Dr. Crocker taught for five years at George Mason University and Northern Virginia Community College before she was uh, expelled, essentially, because they didn't like the fact that she was disagreeing with Darwinian evolution in the classroom. And we've told Dr. Crocker's story, or at least part of her story, of how she got expelled from George Mason in the last couple podcasts. And many more details, of course, are available in her book, Free to Think, Why Scientific Integrity Matters. But in this last podcast, I'd like to focus a little bit more on some of the general principles of education and academic freedom that you believe in and that you advocate in your book. So, Dr. Crocker, thanks for coming back on ID the Future for another podcast. Well, thank you for having me. Well, I spent many years myself studying evolution at the undergrad and graduate levels at a public state university, so you can imagine the kind of perspective that was taught in my classes. And, and I know as a student that I really appreciated it when a professor or a teacher taught a subject so objectively that um, I didn't feel that they were trying to push one view or another, and they really allowed us students to make up our own minds. And this made me feel, well, I think as your book suggests, it made me feel free to think. And so I always felt that one of the hallmarks of a good professor was that he or she didn't necessarily teach a subject in a way where students could tell exactly where the professor stood. And so my question for you is, when all of the heat came on you at George Mason University, did your students feel that you were pushing one view or another? Or I guess maybe to put another way, could they even tell what you personally believed on the topic of evolution? The student letters I have, all the students have said that they could not tell what I believed when I taught on the subject of evolution, that they felt that I was trying to very fairly give them both sides of the argument and also allow them to think for themselves about what the, um, about what the truth is. In fact, I gave an exam question where I asked them about the evidence for and against evolution, and I asked them to defend what they believe based on facts, not on feelings. Students say, well, you know, which way do you want us to go? And I always said to them, I don't really care what you say, provided you back it with facts, which I think is very important for students to learn that, to learn to understand the facts well enough to be able to apply them. According to the letters from the students, they could not tell what I personally believed based on what I said. Um, you can read that for yourself in the book. I've published letters from students. My favorite letter is from a student who was already a lawyer and was in my class because he wanted to eventually become a physician. I have no doubt he achieved it because he was a very, very good, good student. But he wrote a very heated letter in my defense, and uh, it's kind of fun to read it. It's, it's, again, it's in the book. Will you write in your book, Dr. Crocker, that students need to be taught that experts do agree and that they can be fallible? Why do you feel that way? I think if people in general don't understand that experts can be fallible, it takes away their power to make decisions in their lives. If people are told that, you know, physicians are always right, then they can't think about the medications that they might be told are best for them. Now, physicians do the best they can, but they're not always right. And so it is good to seek a second opinion and even to do some research for yourself. Experts give psychiatric evaluations that aren't always correct. And one way you know that is because they give different ones. And I, I know of one student who was told that he would need to be on medication for post-traumatic stress for the rest of his life. Well, I know this student, and he is not on medication, and he 
is doing just fine eight years later. And so he was empowered by actually realizing that experts aren't always right. The nutrition pyramid, people for years have been told low fat, high carbohydrate. What have we got? Fattest nation in the world. Experts <laughs> aren't always right. People need to, know their, need to know that there are options and they need to be given the information so they can take responsibility for their own lives. I just feel it's very important for people to be free to think. Well, you tell some stories in your book about students you encountered who were, they were actually afraid to be open about their pro-ID views. And what I'd like to ask you is, are there really students out there who have good reasons for being afraid about basically coming out of the closet that they're pro-ID? Or as a cynical ID skeptic might say, is this just paranoia that's being spread and there's really no reason these students need to be afraid? Well, it's very easy to dismiss other people's stories as paranoia, and it's very easy to say there were other reasons. Nobody ever believes it might happen to them. I try in my life to make sure that I give people the benefit of the doubt and to listen to their story to the end. One evolutionist student of mine who, well, actually he's an evolutionist student I know, told me about a physics professor where they were talking about the stars and about how amazing they were. And this student said, well, what do you think about intelligent design? And he reported back to me that the physics professor was very, very frightened and said, never talk about that again. I never want to hear those words from your mouth. Well, that to me sounds, well, certainly like paranoia on the part of the professor. Another uh, story I have is, is about a bio professor who was making fun of students who asked questions in their class. And the student who reported this to me told me that he could see those students shaking with the upset they felt about how the professor was making fun of them. Because I know the sources, I tend to believe these stories, but obviously I can't reveal the names of the students who said these things because that would not be protecting them. But what I would say is somebody who doesn't need protecting is Dr. Larry Moran of the University of Toronto, and this is what he says about students. Flunk the idiots. 40% of the freshman class at UCSD reject Darwinism. The university has become alarmed and has offered remedial instruction for those who believe in ID. UCSD should never have admitted them in the first place, just flunk the lot of them. Well, do students have a reason to keep their views quiet? I would say yes. I certainly, <laughs> being a UCSD uh, alumnus, I can understand that. And I can actually remember when I was a graduate student at UCSD taking courses at Scripps Institution for Oceanography, I took a graduate seminar that was actually about intelligent design. And we had, for one of the sessions, Dr. Russell Doolittle, the very well-known biochemist who studies the blood clotting system, who Michael Behe talks about in Darwin's Black Box. Dr. Doolittle was asked to come in and talk about what was wrong with Michael Behe's arguments. And really briefly, what Dr. Doolittle did was he came in and his exact words was that he said that the most effective tool he had to combat intelligent design and what he called creationists, the exact word he used was ridicule. He said that was the most effective tool, was to use ridicule when combating these people. And I was sitting there, a little student in this graduate seminar, feeling very uncomfortable and wasn't necessarily fearing for my career. And he was just a guest lecturer. He actually wasn't the regular professor in the class. Uh, one of the regular professors did <laughs> often ridicule intelligent design proponents. But, I mean, that aside, this, this is not an uncommon mentality. And so I can certainly see how students would feel this way, even at UCSD. I guess my question then for you is, how do you feel that your book, Free to Think, will benefit students who may wish to go into the sciences? Well, um, actually, I want to go back to what you said about ridicule and just point out that ridicule is the opposite of the careful evaluation of data that is held up as being what scientists should do. But uh, as to how I hope it will benefit students, well, I hope it will reinforce their understanding that they need to think about everything they're taught and not just regurgitate for the sake of their exams. That it might be that sometimes professors are wrong and sometimes textbooks are wrong or sometimes they're outdated and that it is important to understand the information well enough to be able to think about it. I also hope that it'll serve as a warning for those who feel that they should challenge their professors, those who want to go into the sciences, that maybe they should stay quiet until after they have tenure. 
Obviously, that's an individual decision, but I would say that at least the students need to have the opportunity to think about whether it's wise to publicly challenge their professors before they step off the edge of the diving board, as I did, and then find themselves falling. Yeah, there's obviously no one-size-fits-all advice here, but I agree with what you're saying. How can parents prepare their kids who are students right now, maybe high school students, for what they will encounter at the university? I think the most important thing that parents can do is to educate their children and not to leave the responsibility to the schools. I know that puts extra stress on parents, but I really believe that the parents need to help their children understand that teachers can be and often are wrong and teach them to logically evaluate facts for themselves. Actually, we've had a lot of fun just doing that in front of the television. When we're told that two out of three dentists prefer a certain toothpaste, when even when my children were younger, I used to say, okay, how many people do you think the advertisers asked? Was it only three dentists? They don't say. Were two out of the three dentists employed by the advertisers? They also don't say that. And just to help the children to think through these things and to think, oh, you know, I might not be being told the whole truth and nothing but the truth. In the case of the debates surrounding origins, I think this requires teaching the students or their children the scientific arguments. After all, they certainly won't hear the whole story in school, and I think it's very important that they do hear more than what they are going to be taught in college. So can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing now and the organization you've started, the American Institute for Technology and Science Education? Well, the byline for the American Institute for Technology and Science Education is good science based on evidence, not consensus. And this obviously needs a bit of unpacking. Um, I, in my past, have had experience as a medical research scientist working on grants for pharmaceutical companies. Obviously, I've had experience as a professor working with students. Now I have experience as an expelled scientist, and I'm just a citizen of the United States which is a country that values freedom. In those experiences, I've noticed breaches in scientific integrity in many areas. For example, when data are not favorable, quite often a company will require the scientists who've done that work not to publish that, and I have had personal experience of that. Students often cheat, and professors often don't report it. And that is a concern to me because that shows a lack of scientific integrity, but also it harms the students in the future. George Mason was concerned that I might give students information that would allow them to critically assess the information they're given on evolution. Again, a lack of scientific integrity. Advertisements on TV for various medications. Basically, what I did was I put together all those experiences and I said, what is the foundational issue? And what I realized was it's a lack of integrity in science. Now, don't get me wrong. As we said, I believe in the first pod class, scientists are genuine people, and they're seeking advances in their area of science. But I'm also very aware that they are dependent on a paycheck, on getting grants, on publishing, and that they are tempted to ignore inconvenient data and do. Um, Companies are tempted to make their product seem better than it is, to get as large a market as it is. Students are tempted to cheat to pass a test. But what I want to do through this organization is publicize the fact that stepping away from scientific integrity, it doesn't produce the results you wish it would. In other words, it's been found that companies that hide problems actually have a bigger loss financially than those who just admit it up front that, oh, this drug doesn't work or it kills people or whatever they have to do. Students who cheat usually do fail the class. The purpose of 8C is to be a consortium of scientists and engineers that are working together to educate the public and to advocate for scientific integrity. We want to give people accurate information and the tools to assess scientific claims for themselves. If people want to know more, it is possible to sign up at the 8C splash page. We don't have a website yet, but we will by July. But the um, the splash page is at www.aitse.org, and there you can sign up to receive a monthly newsletter and be updated with information on things that are relevant to scientific integrity. Well, I'd really encourage our listeners to check out the website for the American Institute for Technology and Science Education. Also, check out Dr. Crocker's book, Free to Think, Why Scientific Integrity Matters, 
published by Leafcutter Press in 2010. It's well-written. It's a lot of fun to read. It's a heartwarming story that also gives you a real appreciation for what scientists and professors and faculty are facing in, the, in academia today when they simply speak out and challenge Darwinian evolution or support intelligent design. So, Dr. Crocker, thank you very much for standing up for scientific integrity, and thank you for being on the show with us. Well, thank you for having me. It was, uh, it was a real pleasure. Well, I'm Casey Luskin with ID the Future. Again, check out Free to Think, Why Scientific Integrity Matters. Thanks for listening.